that's you know a, a very important part of things. It's easy to get wrapped up in the day to day, but but you have to take a, a long term view of the future. So, what is Greens Creek? Well, it's a high grade polymetallic uh, ore body mine mill, etc. Um, we have four different pay pay metals that we recover. Silver is the most important. We're a major producer of zinc that we produce over 100 million pounds of contained zinc and concentrate every year. We have a nice gold credit, and we also produce lead. We market those products worldwide, primarily around the Pacific Rim. Um, we have an underground mine, a surface concentrator where we recover those products, and in addition to that, we have some some pretty extensive infrastructure. We have a power plant where we can generate all the power that we need to, uh, to run our facility. We now have an electrical inner tie so that when there's surplus power on the Juno grid, we're able to buy that, which works well you know, for, for both the, the consumers here because that goes to offset some of the cost of the hydro. Works very well for us and it's good for the environment as well. We have a dry stack tailing facility that I'll talk to you a bit more about later. We have three water treatment plants um, where we treat all of our process and contact water. And then we have a camp facility and we have an international port facility as well. Everything that comes onto the island or leaves the island except people leaves out of Hawk Inlet. We have a, we have a dock at Young Bay that is strictly for transportation of uh, people. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> as part of the original mandate and our desire to, to mitigate our impact, we've tried to keep the footprint small. Uh, at present, it's only 350 acres and about half of that or 45% of that is, is the road system. Our targets to increase to 2,300 tons per day this year. Uh, we're working hard on that. We haven't quite hit it yet, but we're, we remain optimistic. Greens Creek has been roughly a 10-year mine for 23 years. Uh, it's, it's not untypical uh, for underground mines to uh, only work off of about 10 years' worth of reserves. It's, you're looking for a needle in a haystack when it comes to discovering and delineating um, underground deposits. And so you kind of build every year, you're doing exploration and more drilling work to try and replace the, the resources and the reserves that you've produced during the year. And, and for over 20 years, Greens Creek has, has been successful in that. Some years, we don't quite replace everything. Other years, we, we replace more than we consume. So. And uh, as part of that ongoing investment, one of our major pieces of infrastructure that will be required to sustain the business into the future is, is an expansion of the tailing facility. So local benefits. Uh, <clears throat> right now, I, I think as of today, we have 365 direct employees. Uh, we're still trying to hire. Um, that number will go up a, a bit. Uh, but 370 is probably a good round number, and about 200 other jobs that are attributable to the mine. These are these are good paying jobs. Uh, you know, our payroll and benefits, 47 million dollars last year. So these uh, and they come with good benefits. So they're the the kind of jobs you can raise a family on. Uh, we're the largest private employer in Juneau. Uh, we're a significant employer, employer in Southeast, especially in terms of payroll. 75% um, of our workforce resides in Alaska and 90% of that 75% is in Southeast. More than $27 million in goods and services purchased from uh, Southeast Alaska, uh, businesses, uh, government organizations, other organizations. And we have the dubious distinction, I think, last year being the largest taxpayer to the uh, city and borough of Juneau, property taxpayer. We're hoping Kensington will knock us off of that pedestal. <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> but uh, anyway, um, 
and even more importantly, I think, than the donations we make to community events and organizations is the involvement of our employees that, that live here in the community as well. And we encourage that. Uh, it, it's quite a thing when you have to get up at three something in the morning to catch a five o'clock boat and you don't get back home until after 6 p.m. and yet you still find, uh, take time out of your personal life anyway to be involved in, in the community. And we appreciate that of our workforce. Um, Greens Creek uh, has always uh, strived to, to be a model of environmental responsibility. Um, we're not perfect, but we make that a high priority and we continually try, try to to improve. Um, you can't get off the, the boat and walk up the dock and not realize that you have a privilege to work in a real special place and we take that responsibility seriously. And a commitment to safety and health and, and not only is it the right thing to do, it's always been the right thing to do, it's good business and frankly in today's world you will not maintain uh, the ability to operate if, if you don't put health and safety and the environment, you know, as priorities. Um, site layout for uh, those of you who are not familiar, but uh, 5 a.m., 5 p.m., come rain, come shine, no matter who's on the boat, whether it's the general manager or not, the boat leaves, uh, get off dock with uh, you know, up to 150 people on their way to Young Bay where they'll get off and they'll get on a bus for a five mile ride if they work at Hawk Inlet over what we call the A Road. And those that work at Hawk Inlet will get off there. Uh, the rest of us that work up at the mine site have another eight mile ride up what we call the B Road to the 920 mine mill site. Uh, 920 is just elevation. Uh, we're not real clever when it comes to <laughs> naming things, frankly. <coughs> you can probably take responsibility for that. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it works out to be between all the changes and everything. It's an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half commute each way. So that takes a bite out of the day as well. Uh, our existing tailing facility is uh, right near Hawk Inlet. Um, I don't have a picture that will show it later on, so I'll just describe one of the alternate proposals that we don't think is, is, is as good as ours is calling for uh, a new tailing facility in previously undisturbed ground on what the A Road, about three miles uh, away from, from the existing one. So this is a picture of the... Uh, the uh, mine mill site portals here for the underground mine. Um, you know, we have a warehouse up there. We have uh, the mill concentrator there. We have surface shops. We have the power plant. We have the admin building. Everything's kind of tucked into a real tight spot there. And then this is an overview of the dry stack tailing facility. You'll see um, kind of in the, in the center to the right, that is the, the tailing pile. The pond there is a pond where all of the contact water uh, from, from the tailings or the disturbed area, it will flow into there uh, prior to going to water treatment or any process water that we're not able to recycle. So we have three water treatment plants, but the big one is, is down here and everything goes through it to meet the, the permit limitations before it, it's discharged. And there'll be another better picture, but frankly, what we're proposing anyway is our expansion would be just an expansion of this facility to the south or, or coming down this way. Hawk Inlet. I still think we have the best looking camp of any mine I've ever been to. It, it is an old converted uh, cannery. Um, there are a couple of new buildings there and there's another one being assembled now. The, the new one, we kind of tried to stay with the, the red and white color scheme of the old cannery. 
and then the port. All of our supplies and materials come in, uh, fuel barges, uh, AML, we're, uh, we see a lot of them. And uh, yeah, um, and then the ships that come in are loaded with the concentrates. So, exploration is necessary, that investment and success there in order to replace those resources and then reserves so that we can continue operations. And the other piece of the puzzle is investing in the infrastructure as well. So, the mine's been around since 1989. Um, in, in some cases, we've kind of outgrown the, the original facilities, and in other cases, they just need a good uh, facelift. Um, last year, we expanded the, the dry, which is the showers, the locker rooms, et cetera, for the miners. We'd outgrown it, and we got that done, and we also did a, a welding shop addition at the same time there. If you've ever wondered what a million dollar paint job looks like, uh, this, is, uh, this is an example of one. We have three major bridges out there and uh, they're a very important and expensive piece of, of infrastructure and the time has come where we need to do some expensive work on them. Last year we probably got the most difficult one done. Uh, you, everything has to be, the scaffolding has to be hung underneath, containment has to be put up so that all the cleaning, all the painting, anything from that has to be captured so that it isn't released into the environment. So it's, um, it's work, pretty specialized work that was done. We brought in some uh, outside contractors for that because these are pretty specialized skills not available locally. Uh, most of our major construction projects, though, have relied on, on local contractors. Um, port corrosion protection, again, nothing real sexy, but it has to be done or things start to fall down. Our camp, uh, both to improve the quality of the camp and also the capacity of the camp, uh, we're directing a new building that will have 60 rooms, 120 beds this year. The modules were purchased uh, from a company in, in northern Alaska and barged down here and they're being erected by a local contractor. Last year we did a tailings expansion that was probably the last, it's, it's really the last expansion, expansion that makes a lot of economic sense within the current permitted footprint. Um, and and it's really the last expansion of any size that can be done within that permitted footprint as well. Uh, it involved a power line and a road relocation. It involved uh, a lot of diversions because when we build tailings, we want to keep the clean water out and we want to keep any contact water in so that we can collect it and treat it and manage it properly. And we had to put in a, a lining system to do that as well. So this area here is what was expanded and so now we're able to fill in basically this notch here, this will more or less from the top of the existing facility come over and we'll fill in all of that area there as well. And again, our proposal long term is to just keep building the pile out incrementally in that direction. So, again, I guess that brings us to the need for long-term tailings expansion. So, what are tailings? Uh, you, you hear a lot about, about tailings, they're bad, I guess, is, is usually what you hear, you know. Um, we mine ore, it contains a certain amount of uh, minerals that we recover and we market. So about 21% of our ore ends up in products, and the rest of it is tailings. Uh, the minerals on the left-hand side there are pretty much uh, the minerals that we seek to recover and, and the minerals that make up the tailings are on the right-hand side, at least the preponderance of that. Everything that we uh, produce up at the mill, whether it's a concentrate or whether it's tailings, it's first dewatered in filter presses 
so that then we can truck it in covered trailers down the hill, either to the concentrate shed awaiting shipment or uh, the portion that is not used as backfill underground is trucked down to the dry stack tailing facility. So about half of our tailings are used as backfill underground. We, we blend cement in with it so that it becomes kind of like a concrete product without aggregate and it's taken back underground to backfill voids from the ore that we've removed and support that ground so that then we can come in and mine the adjacent ore. So about half of the tailings that are produced in the mill go back underground. The rest go down to the dry stack tailing facility. And there's several requirements of, of a tailings facility. Uh, one is to isolate this material from the environment. In our particular case, uh, we're looking to prevent infiltration of water and oxygen in the pile because those are two of the ingredients that would drive undesirable reactions over the long term. You need to design a facility that has a liner system to isolate it from the environment. Again, these diversions that I talked about where you, you put those in to keep outside clean water out and, and also collection systems to make sure that you're collecting any contact water and you're managing that and treating that appropriately. You have to have long-term geotechnical stability, so you don't want this thing to be sloughing or sliding or anything like that. And you need to build something where you're thinking about the long-term closure of this thing too. I mean, when it comes to something like a, a tailings facility, that is going to be there forever. So you need to design it, you need to operate it in such a way that ultimately you can close it in such a way that you return that land to the appropriate use afterwards. In our case, it will be contoured, it will be capped, and then it will be revegetated, reforested uh, to, to return it to as near as practicable a, a natural state. So, We've recognized that, you know, the, the permitted area that we had, uh, we would run out of space there before we finished the current known reserves. And we have this history over 23 years of continuing to add those reserves as well. Uh, in 2009, internally, we started discussions about, well, where do we think the next big expansion area should be and we looked at several based upon some of the previous analysis that had been done and we came to the conclusion, look, the best thing for us to do is to continue in the area we're in, the area we've already disturbed, we understand it and it'll just be a continuation of, of what we've been doing for, for over 20 years. So we went to the Forest Service and uh, in 2010, we described our proposal to them, and that kind of initiated uh, a NEPA process. Um, the scoping and alternatives analysis uh, were done with public meetings and using a third-party contractor that works for the Forest Service. Uh, we get to pay the bill, but they work for the Forest Service. And, uh, you know, I guess two years later now, <laughs> we have the draft environmental impact statement out. And there'll be a, a comment period here through June 4th where the public has the opportunity to review this document and then submit comments on it. After that, the agencies will review the comments. Uh, they'll address those as they deem appropriate in the final environmental impact <coughs> statement and the record of decision, which we hope we'll be able to get in November. Uh, our timing in terms of a presidential election has not turned out to be so swift, but uh, we don't have much choice in that matter. And then we'd be implementing the decision in January. We still have several months of detailed design work that has to be done. There are also specific permits. The, the EIS process, the NEPA process, is the first step you still have to get all of the specific permits before you can construct anything. So there's, there's probably at least six months worth of work even once the EIS process is finalized before we could be in a position to begin any construction. 
So uh, the alternatives, there's always the no action alternative. In our case, that doesn't mean the mine never existed. It means that we continue to operate until we have reached the capacity of the permitted footprint that we currently have. And that, that would be some years out there. Um, there's our proposal, which is basically just an extension of, of the existing facility. And you have seen things, you uh, will read things if you care to, that talks about this in terms of 30 to 50 years. Um, the area that we've done the NEPA analysis on is adequate for that. Um, we believe when it comes to something like this, we should look at the history and take a long-term <laughs> view. However, we're not implying we have 30 or 50 years of reserves at this point in time. We don't. Um, but we want to design a facility such that we can then we can look at it, uh, the overall long-term ultimate facility. What could it look like if we had, you know, up to 30 to 50 years worth of ore? And then we will design phased approaches to keep the disturbance minimized. And frankly, we don't want to invest in, in a tailings expansion that we don't have reserves for. Um, so those sorts of things will probably be in five to ten year increments. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be in phases. They will only be for, for what we recognize that we, we need based upon our, our current reserves. But in order to do that and design them properly, you have to kind of have a, a good idea of, well, what could it ultimately be so that the pieces will, will fit into place should they be needed. Um, there are two other alternatives that the Forest Service um, came up with. I mean, part of the NEPA process, you always have the no action alternative, you always have the proponents alternative, and then part of the NEPA process is to look at are there other alternatives that would be better? Uh, and there are two that have been put forward. One I've kind of described that, that says, okay, no more expansion into the monument. Right now, our current tailing facility, about half of it is already in the monument, and all of the mine mill facilities are in the monument. But if they didn't want to expand further into the monument, then they would they would look at this site two and a half, three miles out in previously undisturbed ground. And that is the, the C alternative. And then D is just kind of a combination where they say, okay, you can expand a little bit more into the monument, but then we want you to go out and build a new facility. Um, we, we don't think that's a good idea because, frankly, why would you want to go disturb previously undisturbed ground. It would require uh, a road upgrade and more heavy hauling over a road that gets very little traffic at this point in time. We'd have to install a major pipeline in order to bring the water from that satellite facility to our water treatment plant. Um, and probably more importantly would be during the closure, now you have two sites that have to be closed and monitored etc. for many, many years. So we still feel that, you know, keeping all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak, and watching that basket very carefully is a superior proposal. So uh, in terms of project needs, we'll need this expansion in order to support, you know, our, our continued operations. Uh, we invest several million dollars every year to continue to explore to discover more resources and move them into reserves. Um, but that only makes sense if, if we can have the, the tailings uh, capacity that we're going to need as well. Uh, we also have waste rock that we, we generate through mining and also there are some legacy <laughs> sites that we're moving that waste rock so that we can reclaim that site. and. and Early on, there were some characteristics in the life of, uh, or characteristics of some of this waste that weren't fully appreciated, and we're, we're trying to clean those areas up, put them in the tailings. Actually, mixing the tailings with rock is 
somewhat superior to the option of, of storing them separately because the rock tends to reinforce and give more stability to the tailings and the tailings tend to kind of surround and, and isolate the rock a lot better from, from water and air. So, um, trying to think here. So, how can you help? Um, there is a 500 page document you could wade through. <laughs> In fact, I brought a copy of it, but I didn't dig it out. Uh, or, a, if, if you're interested, uh, we, we put together a, a, a newsletter anyway where we've, we've sent out a, a much shorter version, uh, at least, of, of the facility, why we believe it's needed. Uh, why we think it's both good for us and the community and, and uh, some, some thoughts for you to consider as, as you comment in terms of um, why we believe that our proposal is, is mm -hmm. the superior one to either the C or the, the D alternative. So um, again, if you write your email on those lists, uh, we'll be sure and get you on the list, or you can contact um, myself or Jennifer Saran. Uh, it's um, our first initial, so it would be S. Hartman at hecla-mining.com. Um, you can go that route as well. And the comments, uh, the ones that are considered most seriously by the agencies are substantive, which means they're specific. So. Uh, rather than saying, for instance, I like the jobs the mine provides, if you can say, well, the mine affects my business this specific way, either, you know, positive, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> those of you who want to write negative comments, don't bother. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, so anyway, those, those ones that are specific anyway, will we'll get a lot more attention. It, it's not a beauty contest in any regard. It, it never hurts to have nice things uh, said about you, even if they're not substantive. But, uh, but specific things will be more helpful, and particularly thing, uh, comments from people who reside here in, in Juneau and southeast Alaska will, will probably get more consideration as well. So um, moving forward, you know, we want to continue to provide a safe and healthy workplace for our, uh, our people, mitigate the environmental impacts. Uh, we believe in continuous improvement, so we're always looking to optimize you know, our production, our recovery, our costs, and, and make those high quality investments for the future and so that we can continue to be a good neighbor and contribute to Alaska's economy. So. With that, I thank you for your attention. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer. Yeah, I don't have a question, but I just want to tell you, we appreciate you coming and keeping us filled in on what's going on. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Green Street received a permit to do some uh, drilling. We, we never received a permit. We received a press release. <laughs> and there's the rub. Uh, we, were, we were on track. Every year, our, our surface exploration requires approval by the Forest Service. And it is typically done under a categorical exclusion, as are probably the majority of decisions that the Forest Service makes. Um, the categorical exclusion process that the Forest, I'm on dangerous ground uh, now, but I, I'm going to tell you my understanding of it is um, they had determined that it was legal and appropriate for them to not have uh, an extensive formal public comment review appeal process for all of these things that could range from our exploration permit to wood gathering. You know, I mean, otherwise things are going to grind to a halt. Uh, there were parties that disagreed with that and filed suit. Uh, one of those suits was turned over on a technicality uh, some subsequent years later 
Uh, another one uh, was found again. They, it was determined against the Forest Service anyway, and an injunction issued to halt everything uh, that uh, had not yet been finalized and started anyway under categorical exclusion, and that. That affected, I think, like 700 activities uh, that range from weddings to us. Um, but you know, you're a, you're a judge, uh, or, or you're, the, you're, you're uh, the chief of the Forest Service. You get an injunction issued by a judge. You have to comply with the law, and so that has really kind of put us in a tough spot because we were just getting ready to, you know, get the final written document and start letting contracts out to drilling companies, to helicopter companies, et cetera, and all of that had to be put on hold. Um, what the Forest Service has done is, is as quick as they could, they got public notices out for, uh, for us and other affected parties anyway. So that process has started. I believe there is a 30-day comment period followed by a 45-day review appeal period. If we get through that, maybe in July we can start, which is unfortunate because we have a short season as it is. You know, the snow starts to fly in the high country. Um, you know, I mean, but September even, you're starting to get uh, a bit nervous. So. Well, that press release um, got a lot of publicity saying that the roadless rule works in the Tongass. And is this due to the roadless rule? It is not due to the roadless rule. Uh, the roadless rule had turned what used to be a local decision that probably took a month into a decision that required action out of the Secretary of Agriculture's office and turned that into a six-month process. And now we're talking about tacking on formal comment and appeal uh, process onto that. So I don't know where it's going to end up, but a person could envision a year-long permitting process for a three-month annual program. And it, it, it becomes very difficult, particularly with the exploration, because you're always building on your most recent knowledge and retargeting. So. Um, it's, I don't know where it's going for sure, uh, you know, there are, there are people that are trying to work, work through it in the agencies too and, and I guess find the best solution that they can, so. Yes, Frank. Scott, if I can uh, try to just get the clip notes of your, your talk, you basically said that not going to foul the SEC, that through, uh, uh, reserves and resources, we could be looking here at 50 years of Green Street to come. Yet, I no didn't say that, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah don't, don't take that liberty. I, can, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> so for, for planning purposes, the agency is looking at 50 years. So the yeah. community really can be just looking at well, possibly something like we, that. We've been a 10 year mine for 23 years. And we are continuing to invest millions of dollars a year in a systematic, sustained exploration program. We are, we are investing many millions of dollars to rehabilitate infrastructure, to add infrastructure, and that isn't for a 10-year mine life. Now, there is no guarantee that we will find anything more than we currently have, but the nature that's the nature of our business, and we believe that we will, and we're backing that up with our, you know, a lot of money and a lot of work. And when it comes to something like tailings, we don't want it to be uh, a short-sighted five to ten-year exercise. We need a long-term strategy, and then we will we will construct it in a responsible manner in increments as, as it's needed. Right, so that's on one side of the equation. The flip side is, if you don't get your permits, you're shut down in two to three years. Yeah, uh, it you know so I don't I don't know in, when I don't in, right yeah I I don't know when exactly we will get probably real innovative about how we can stuff ten pounds in a five pound bag. Uh, uh, yeah, blivet, <laughs> um, but. 
it will get very difficult because it's not just capacity, it's also surface area. I didn't show uh, uh, slides of that, but running a dry stack tailings is particularly difficult in a rainy area. Yes, Kathy? Scott, um, what kind of support are you getting from CPJ? Are they, are they in the process of doing a resolution? We, we presented, Jennifer Serrano, our environmental manager, presented to the Assembly of the Whole Tuesday? Monday. Monday. Monday night. And I mean, from our perspective, it was very well received. And uh, we'll continue talking. Yeah. Keep me out of trouble here, Mike. Yeah. Just stick your hand up my back and make my mouth work. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I'll be following up with you because we'd like to see some action. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the, the timing of the draft, you know. It was going to come out, it's going to come out, it's going to come out. And so it was difficult to plan these presentations ahead of time and, and you know, also be well prepared to talk to you about what does it mean because we didn't know what was going to be in the draft before it came out. So, um, but we, we have reviewed it. I think we've put together the most important points and we'll be continuing to, to post new information as we develop it. If, if you get uh, on our newsletter site, so. If you, if you signed up for the newsletter too, there's some easy links on it to uh, write your comments directly to the Forest Service and email it right now. Okay. Thank you very much.